Thank you very much. Before I turn to Oret for the question on safe space, I would just like to ask, I saw so many nodding hats, hats when, he's, when you talked about how difficult it can be internally, but unfortunately I don't have any other company on my speakers list. Would anybody like to share uh, experiences in operationalizing the guiding principles, which is very, very tough. I think everybody who has ever been involved in such an experience can uh, say that. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm very interested in the topic of creating a safe space and working in particular with your internal stakeholders. I'm based in Beijing and we run a group called Beijing Ethics Network, Ben. And in order to create the safe space, we have to invite a multiplicity of external stakeholders. We have to invite the government. We have to invite the Chinese NGOs, as well as our corporate clients. We're a law firm. But within, when we discuss the Ruggy principles, and we do, the, the people who help each other most are definitely the other. The, it's this B2B meeting, the business-to-business -business meeting. Mm -hmm because the issues happen so quickly in China. There's just no time for thinking. There's very often that there's no structure in place to uh, help people in companies when maybe somebody's kidnapped or imprisoned. And people have to help each other very directly. And we find the safe space has been created um, by sort of the more reforming elements of government who are willing to partner with us on that, in that process. Thank you very much. Would you like to come in on the safe space or on the business or both? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, before you start, may I just mention that the next session will start at two o'clock. So you don't have to rush out of the room right now. I've just been informed. Next session starts at 2 o'clock, and I will try to finish at 1.30 in order to respect your right to food. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, well, two, two things I would say. One is with the safe space, actually, at one. 30 or maybe 2 o'clock, there is one session, is Roger here, uh, that we will have where some of the, some companies are actually working together on this whole uh, implementation and creating a safe space uh, as a project within the working group. So I think that's going to be a place where uh, companies can get together and, and discuss. There's been some questions about that, but I, I'm quite happy to hear the value that others have seen with regard to the safe space. I'll give a little bit of a nuance on the safe space, and the safe space is, you, I do believe you can find a safe space with stakeholders that you have built a relationship with. Uh, in my case, I'm with Procter & Gamble, and we have shared our, our human rights policy. We're in the process of getting feedback, and it was rather interesting uh, to send it out and to actually have some folks provide feedback, people that I trust, uh, and to provide feedback and saying, wait a minute, I think you're going too far. You're, you're saying some things that I'm not sure you can actually implement. You really need to reconsider, uh, you know, is this just aspirational or something that you can implement? And that for me was a safe space, but with external parties that I actually work with and have built a relationship. So I think that's another place where don't just view safe space as something that's just within the company or within industry. I think trusted stakeholders are others that can provide you feedback uh, and you can go to them with problems and, and ask for, for help in solving some of the issues and challenges that you have. Thank you very much. Now I think, Aurat, it's your turn. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Christian, in answer to your question, you know, the work we've done with you folks in both Turkey and in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire created uh, or, or resulted in conclusions that required action on the part of government, on the part of industry, on the part of uh, international companies and local companies. 
And actually, when I say government, this goes all the way to the European Union and to some, some intergovernmental inter organizations. So part of the role of the safe space then is to figure out who does what and what is the, the burden sharing, what is the allocation of responsibilities. And absolutely cru crucial to that discussion is what are the reasonable expectations that we can have of each other? Because I think the safe space doesn't work uh, if you don't have a reasonable expectation that we will all share, bear our share of the responsibility and account to each other. So safe space, don't let the word safe imply uncritical or non-contested space. It's obviously an area of contestation. We're debating and often wrestling with this question of shared responsibilities and joint accountability for the outcome. So I would add a couple those, those qualifications to the safe space concept. Everybody has expectations, they're reasonable expectations, they need to be measured, they need to be accounted for, and ultimately we need real outcomes, otherwise the safe space becomes a meaningless one. But it works to the extent that everyone is willing to come into that discussion in a non-judgmental and open-minded um, fashion with the understanding that we're actually working together to figure out stuff that none of us had figured out before we came into the room. Thank you very much. Now, the issue of safe space, I would like to ask the representative from the UN Global Compact Network Australia who signed up. Yes, does your network provide such a safe space or is it one of its... I, I must admit, I've been sitting here going, when will someone from the Global Compact speak up? Because I think that's our natural purpose. Um, with uh, the principles clearly committing to human rights, our experience in the last 18 months has been uh, an absolute crowding in of our members to share practice. And I guess just to give some, some, some key examples, um, I was particularly interested in the question around how do we do um, how do we do assessment and identification of those human rights risks, particularly with the language of that principle. Principle 18, it speaks to two very different discourses. One is risk assessment within a business. The other is impact assessment. And they're actually two different sets of professionals within a business. Um, and, and I had the opportunity, and we've heard this in our members, and this is some of the, the challenge they're coming up with, particularly the resource sector members. Um, I was at the International Impact Association Conference in Portugal in May, and the impact assessment community believe that human rights impact assessment is their natural space, that this is theirs. Yet, it, what I was hearing in terms of uh, certainly um, extrata, we're talking about that in, in, the, in the Global Compact in Australia, about using the established company's human rights risk assessment process and front-ending it. So using the existing risk assessment process but putting a different front-end of it um, to get the educational outcome. So I'd certainly say what we've heard is that 70% figure is an accurate figure. However, on education, we are at first base. We may not be in terms of systems and what we have currently, but in terms of almost everyone that we touch within the organisation, education is a first base challenge. I would just acknowledge BHP Billiton, and, and for those who haven't appreciated, they've completed over 30 human rights impact assessments at all of their operations in the last two years. It, it's a phenomenal body of work and one that I'm certainly keen, and, and we, we, we're all kind of asking, can we hear more about in terms of what their organisation's learning has been from that body of work? But there you have it immediately, and that's been within our network, mm -hmm. two very different responses. One is taking a risk assessment process, front-ending it differently to get a response to Principle 18, and the other is to commission independent human rights impact assessments. Can I put in a quick secondary question? Sure. Just on the retrofit, and that's the term that came up in a lot of the work in, in, in the um, guiding principle sessions that we've held, and we've now held, I think, of six of them in the last 18 months, and they've been very well attended. There's been excellent sharing, and they haven't been exclusively just our business members. There's been multi-stakeholder participation. Um, that 
on the retrofitting approach, and I think that is the greatest success in implementing the principles, is to retrofit, recognise what's already been done. Although I notice that some of the uh, mining company health, health and safety professionals are very nervous about talking about safety and managing safety as respecting the right to life, Article 3, but that's another, I, I digress. Um, the thing that really seems to make a lot of our members nervous is the perception that we need to do a whole separate set of stakeholder engagement around human rights. Is there also a legitimate response to Principle 18 that says you can start by re reviewing your existing stakeholder engagement results to do your initial assessment and identification? Or must you, as I heard Alan from the Danish Institute yesterday assert, that the quality of your response to Principle 18, and that is the first element of due diligence, is directly related to the quality of the stakeholder engagement you're doing. Does that make sense in terms of those two are intention? Do we have to, as a first pass, do dedicated human rights engagement, or can we rely on our existing results as a first pass, as a first response to Principle 18? Sorry, that was more than two minutes. I apologise. That's okay. Thank you very much for two very important points. And I know Alan wants to come in, I think, on the first one. Yeah, um, I might have something to say on the second as well. But you know, in, in, in dealing with our um, risk systems, the, a, lo a lot of it is, is, is there, as you say, because about... 90, maybe 95 percent of risks to the company are, or hu of human rights risks are also risks to the company. But the, but the additional point we have to recognize, and this is what we are having to work on, is that there are some cases where that is not the case, and that would apply particularly in our sector to um, vulnerable, vulnerable groups who may not have access to publicity and uh, the voices of NGOs and so on. And um, whose rights can be um, uh, negatively affected with, without the company having to worry about the, um, the, cons the, the, the consequences that one usually has to worry about. So that's the one point we have to do. We, the way the risk system has to be adjusted is to make it rec recognize not only risks to the company, but risks mm -hmm. to, right, to rights holders. Um, and the, the, other, the other part of it, came, which came up a little bit later, I think one of the earlier speakers, is the question of how do you prioritize um, risks? And a lot of the, although the methodology is there to talk about the likelihood of impact and the severity of impact, quite often it's not that easy to, well, very often numbers are sucked out of people's thumbs because it's a very difficult Thing, thing to assess, and I'm not sure we are quite there yet. That's one of the things we're going to have to deal with. Um, on, on the second point you make, just if I can just answer it quickly, I think, of, of course, the, I can't see why there should have to be a separate set of engagement on, on human rights um, in addition to the stakeholder engagement you're doing, but surely, yes, you will have to supplement the nature of that um, engagement to ensure that you have these bases covered too. Thank you. Now I think Dan wants to come in and then maybe Austin on the stakeholders. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for asking that question uh, because, you know, the representatives in the room uh, from corporations, I think you can all appreciate what I'm about to say. Each of our companies has a unique culture. And each of us who uh, have human rights related responsibilities have to go about executing those responsibilities in a different way depending on the way our companies are organized <laughs> and our culture. And the, the issues or the two words that you mentioned, impact and risk, have different reactions uh, by different people internally. And I, I will say, when I have this conversation internally, I, I choose my words very carefully, depending on who I'm talking to and the work that I'm trying to accomplish. So for those of you from corporations, and I see some of you nodding and laughing as I'm saying, they're smiling while I'm saying this, I think it's really important that you think about the culture, think about the audience, 
think about what you're trying to achieve and use your words carefully. That's my advice. Thank you. Before uh, I give the floor to Austin again, this is a very dynamic uh, forum, I can tell. The next session will start at 2.15 sharp. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can continue, I think, as long as the discussion is, is really lively. But I would still like to finish at 1.45. I think we will have a problem with that translation at some stage but we'll, we'll have to see. Maybe you can check whether translation is, is still uh, available. And at this stage, many thanks to the translators up there. Thank you. So, Austin, now. Okay, let me respond to what he's talked about. The, the issue we've had with companies when they do risk assessment is that they only consider the risk that communities pose to the operations, not the risk and impact they pose to community existence. And that's been where the disconnect has been. It's like, if you look at a bank, a bank wants to give you loan. It looks at your assets, your collateral, uh, your business plan. The, the bank does not look at how the management fee they are charging, the legal fees, the terms of the loan will almost make it impossible for you to pay back that loan. So I think that's part of the problem we have. So it's important for companies to, in the assessment, to look at how the operations will affect uh, communities. How feasible is safe space? My argument, if you read the guiding principles very carefully, I think it has three phases. And if you use that phase approach to implementing the guiding principles in a corporation, it makes sense. There's the way you enter a community, your entry behavior. Second is, the middle range, when you're already in operations, and then third is your exit strategy. Now, f if you can't create space, safe space, if your entry behavior is bad, if you don't build trust at the beginning, there's no way somebody will come and sit with you and discuss with you and feel safe. But when the damage is done, you're trying to create space to ameliorate that damage, somebody will never, never agree to that. So I think the best way to read the guiding principle and its implementation is to split it into three. The entry phase, when you are in operation, and then maybe your exit strategy. That helps in ensuring that, you know. Um, there was this question from the working group member, what prompted the companies to go into this in the first place? A good example we have is Chevron in Nigeria. You know, companies have operated under the military. In 1999, we started a transition. That transition was the opening of space for people to air their grievances, which had been locked up during the military. So we saw too much of violence in the Niger Delta. The neglect that I've experienced under the military began to take active voice in the transition. And every responsible company operating in Nigeria knew that something has to give way. So if a company is not conscious of the dynamics of its environment, it might not be able to know exactly what is prompting the game changer. In Nigeria, the transition was important. The violence that accompanied the transition was also important. And then the democratic ethos that was coming on with a new generation of activists was very, very uh, critical. And then um, how do, okay, I've talked about that. And then the issue of, uh, uh, you know, some of these guiding principles and issues around it coming under different names before. You know, one thing about social science is that we must name something properly and label it properly. If we don't do that, if you don't call Holocaust, Holocaust, or genocide, genocide, you are not doing justice to the topic. Look, we're talking about the guiding principles. There are things unique embedded in it that companies have not been doing. Take, for instance, when you have a human rights statement. The guiding principles is specific. Communicate it externally and internally. And let your staff know their responsibilities when it comes to that human rights statement. Many companies had human rights statements or policies mm -hmm. that were merely uh, for declaration of intent. It was for PR purpose. People did not take responsibility for some of the actions they took. But the guiding people is clear on this. So I think uh, <coughs> it, it might not be very, very good for us 
to use the risk assessment of the previous years in order to implement the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. This is something new. This is something innovative. Mm -hmm. It has some things embedded in it that we really need to pull out. And key to that is mm -hmm. labeling. We must name human rights for what it is. Companies must not shy away from calling human rights what it is because it will never change. It will remain human rights. Human rights cannot become health, safety, and environment. Human rights cannot become conflict. It must remain human rights for it to make sense to those who must enjoy it. Thank you very much for several very important points about calling human rights human rights and not hiding them into some social sustainability programs. And the second very important point that we have not discussed yet is internal training. And I do know that Ron Popper was here at some stage from ABB. They have a very extensive a training program. I don't know, Ron, whether you would like to come in with the training program? Share some of your experiences with you without giving away what you're supposed to say on the panel tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't worry, Christy. Uh, can you hear me? Don't worry, Christine, I, I make it up as I go along. Um, as far as training is concerned with, within my company, um, we have two main human rights training programs. One is an awareness raising program, very much driven by the guiding principles uh, and other more, other recent standards that have been adopted internationally. Um, and the other one is a capacity building uh, training program. Um, we're acutely aware that uh, there's a nucleus of very few people who are driving this through a, a corporation that's now 150,000 strong um, and that we need to have people uh, who, who understand human rights risks and opportunities uh, in different parts of the world. And, and as various speakers have mentioned, including Christian Lights, it, it, it's very important to find the right language um, to translate human rights into so that uh, the message gets home uh, as it should. I think that's enough from me. Thank you very much. I have Dwight Justice from the International Trade Union Conference on my list, but I don't know whether he's still here. Yes, please. Would you please react to what you just heard? I'll be happy to react to what I just heard. Um, I. Uh, I keep thinking of risks without opportunities. And I think that that's what the real issue here is with human rights. Uh, I, I've been on this global reporting initiative uh, reworking where we're trying to bring it closer in line with the guiding principles. And every time I said the word risk, somebody else would say, and opportunities, don't forget the opportunities. And uh, I think what's going on here is a conflation of what might be good management practice with responsible management in the sense of in making a decision you weigh the risks and the opportunities. But that's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the, the risk to rights holders. And it may be that these rights holders have no interest or any other stake in, in the company other than the fact that their rights are uh, adversely impacted by the company. And there's no, there's no opportunity there. There. There's a risk there. And so what, what I want to think uh, uh, might contribute to this is it's not always clear in this discussion today when we talk about risks, are we talking about the risk to the company or are we talking about the risk to the right holder? Because I think there is sort of a conflation that becomes very confusing and it's confused here, and I think it's also confused in the CSR world, and I think we need to realize what a game changer Ruggy is. Now, you know, there's a lot of elephants and a few ghosts walking around this room, and I'll, let me introduce one of them to you. It's called, it's over there in the corner, it's called the business case for human rights abuse. And it does exist, it is real, and it's the kind of problem we also need to be discussing. I kept within my two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. This question of 
whose risks are we talking about was a very important issue in several discussions, but I do realize that Margaret would like to come in, right? Please. I, I do think this is very important to start clarifying what we're talking about in relation to risk and risk to the rights holders versus risk to the companies. And if I could share just a, a tool that I use when I get into a company to make sure that we have the focus right. I, I put in what I call counter rights issues. So for example, some rights, if they're not respected, will become a risk to the company, either in terms of reputational damage or community opposition, other things. But there are certain rights that sometimes when, they're, when they are met, they can be a risk to the company. So for example, if you are trying to give uh, same-sex marriage partners access to your community housing in a very traditional society, sometimes that will generate some risk for your company in order to meet those rights. Uh, sometimes if you try to introduce women into a higher level management structure in societies where women are not seen in that role. Again, that can present a risk to your company. So the, the way to do this, I think, is to always stress test it, to make sure that your company has the right angle by introducing some of these scenarios in that will show a very clear difference between treating it as a risk to your company and treating it as a risk to the rights holders where the focus ultimately has to be. Thank you. I would like to give the floor also to the Indian movement, Tupai Amaru. Yes, please. Signora Presidenta. Chair, I am a survivor and an indigenous Quechua survivor of Bolivia, a survivor of the from the exploitation of mining in Bolivia. First of all, I would like to make a couple of comments. First, I'm sorry to say that there is a dialogue between businesses and banks uniquely, and we can't see the point of view from the victims and the civil society that can express their opinion. Secondly, the mandate of this forum, created by the Human Rights Council, has the mandate to draw up legal standards. In other words, concepts and guidelines that need to guide relationships between businesses and indigenous peoples and all people. I'd like to say that the issue is the responsibility, we're looking at the responsibility of multinationals. And I want to refer to two things here. Over the course of history, we can see the direct intervention of multinationals from North American multinational telegraph companies in the government of Salvador Allende in 1973 in Bolivia, the Goyle Oil Company orchestrated and funded the coup d'etat against the government in Guatemala. The American multinational United Trade Company was also involved in overthrowing the government in 1954 for having de decreed a certain law. This history, I could go on, I could add more about human rights violations. And here what we have is the declaration of war. I'm afraid the speaker needs to speak into the microphone. We have the involvement of two Swiss companies here, Glencron and Estrata, and they were involved in violations and crimes in Guatemala, in the Philippines and in Colombia. I, can't, I can go on and on and on. Finally, I'd like to say the following. Who is governing us? Is it the, the banks and multinational companies? Who is governing the people of the world? 
There are a hundred multinational companies that are infinite, infinitely powerful that have 150 f subsidiaries across the world. And there are 50 major financial banks. Amongst them, we have UBS here before us that dominate the world. And there are 10 food industry companies that govern the world. And they have their headquarters in Western countries. I'd like to say the following. They do not recognize human rights. Their objective is financial. Profit. Always earning money. They're not interested in human rights. They haven't come here. I'm, I'm an old militant for human rights. And I've been working for 20 years. And I haven't seen multinationals coming to the sessions for indigenous people's rights. They're not interested in human rights. Our objective is to earn money and make profit. We need to bear that in mind. This is irre ir irreconcilable, I'm afraid. We, we can. These are irreconcilable concepts. Thank you. Thank you. I think you, you did remind us of some of the very important violations of human rights that took place and that are still taking place and that are actually the reason why we are here today. And I am very happy to see that we do have this session right here, right now, where it is possible to raise concerns, as you just did, to listen to each other and to also realize that we are at the beginning of a very difficult process. The guiding principles are a young instrument. They're still in their infancy and we are all on a hopefully very steep learning curve. But we all have to learn a lot. And with this, I would thank you for that statement. I'm looking at my watch and I, I think we need to come to an end and for this I would like to turn over to our working group member Margaret Young and before I do that I have to also acknowledge and I want to acknowledge the presence of the chair of the working group Puvan Selvanathan who joined us. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Margaret, the floor is yours for concluding. Let me thank the, the panelists and the facilitator again for, for a very interesting session. Um, there, I have so many notes that, that I could sift through and, and try to make comments to all the various relevant points, but I think that's, that's part of the process that we'll be going through over the next two days. And of course, this session, which is focused on, on pillar two and that responsibility to respect and what happens in, a, in the companies, uh, will also then channel in to the next session, which we'll have also to, to look at some of the, the challenges around implementing in companies. But, but just to try to broadly wrap up, in, in, uh, when you get inside a company, I think all of us realize it's, it's a, a pretty messy enterprise. I think that's the, the first learning uh, that anybody, when they, they look at the internal politics, the conflict for resources, and everything else that happens in a company, they, they realize that it's, it's a challenge just boiling down from high level principles around pillar two to actually how you implement them in a, a specific company context. And that challenge is also multifaceted in that, as, as we've, we've spoken about uh, this afternoon, you have, you have the challenge first of getting your knowledge base down, of, of actually understanding your impacts, and, and some of that can be challenged by you know, the complexity of the range of impacts that can go through the supply chain. And, and as Nestle informed us, it can be 15 or 19 levels away, our, our actual impact, and, and with varying degrees of control over that. So, so we have just the, the very first challenge of, of getting the knowledge down about where, where we are affecting human rights as, as companies. 
And then if you go to a, a second dimension, it's a challenge about how you work that into the systems of companies. So how you get that across varying risk manage management systems, uh, labor, uh, you know, all, all of the various elements of company departments that are going to need to be called into play when it comes to, to human rights and managing those impacts. And then finally, the third element that we heard about was, was about the culture and the people of the company and how we get that to be aligned with an understanding of, of human rights impacts and all the complexities around the uh, around getting uh, culture and, and messaging down within a company. I think, just to conclude, I, I just want to share a, a personal story with you. When I, I had to laugh when, when our uh, colleague from Microsoft said, you know, my, my biggest challenge is just the internal stakeholders. And, do you know, the, the number of times I have been called into a company and, and put in an office by the CSR manager, and they'll tell me, you know, Margaret, I need you to get to my colleagues in, in the procurement division to make them aware that it's not just about squeezing, you know, squeezing down the last dollar and getting the, uh, getting the suppliers to deliver on time, that you know, if we do squeeze our suppliers, there might be labor implications for, for the suppliers' workers. And I need you to run off to the land management department and tell those people that you know, it's not just about paying the folks who come to you with legal contracts for the land in their hands. It's also about those people who might not hold those legal contracts because they're of the wrong political party or because they're women and they're not allowed to hold land. And I need you to run over to our CSR department and tell those folks that, you know, this isn't about building opera houses or libraries. This is actually about getting down the respect for just the fundamental dignity and needs and, and freedoms of the human being, all of which is captured in that element of respect for human rights. So run along and, and do that internal messaging for me. And, and the reason they'll ask is because I'm an outsider and, and they don't have the traction inside the company because these people are within the CSR department. They're seen as being part of the internal politics and the conflict for resources and time. And, and so they actually pull in the outsiders to try to do some of that dirty work and to get the muscles in. And you know that, I think that is something we need to be aware of too because a, a lot of the challenges that lay before us in terms of getting the implementation of Pillar 2 down are part of these mundane internal politics things that go on within companies as much as it is about the challenge of how we scientifically measure impact and how we how we get it into systems so i'm very glad that that within this discussion we've heard all the elements across you know all everything about what those challenges are within a company from the knowledge base to the systems to the actual culture of the company so i, I want to thank you for a, a very enlightening discussion this afternoon thank you Thank you.